Hmm? Ah. Oh. And I think that's one of the appeals of podcasting is the fact that that you know with so much radio and television, everyone is so everything is so controlled. Yeah. You know, everything is, is has this agenda, and then when you hear someone who's just like, um. You know, because the, the woman you said you interviewed from The Stranger. Um, Leah Tao. Leah Tao. Yeah. I mean, when she did that series about her relationships, I... That was intense. Whew, <laughs> man. I was like, damn. <laughs> I, I was re-listening to one of those episodes uh, uh, just last week. And it was... I, even the second time around, it was yeah. like... Even though, you, you, even though when you know what's coming... <laughs> <laughs> Podcast Junkies, episode 81. And if you're new to the show, then this sounds normal to you. Some background music. I'm in uh, a training session with one of my business coaches, and I wanted to take advantage of the time being out here, outdoors, to record this for you, simply because it's the best time and it's convenient for me. And this is the show where we talk to entertaining, engaging, fantastic veteran and new podcasters who I just find incredibly entertaining and motivating. And I bring the show to you every single Monday, and uh, this week is no different. If you missed the show last week, I spoke to Carrie Gormley. She's a, an old friend, and she's, she's the host of the Running Lifestyle Podcast. We talked a little bit about her sense of adventure and something she really did that was interesting, where she traveled to a different country on her own, uh, lived there for a while, and actually did some traveling in, in, in a part of the country, um, backpacking, that was out of her comfort zone. So we talked through that and what motivated her to do that. So if, if you haven't done so already, I encourage you to check it out, episode 80 with Carrie Gormley. So this week, I have the pleasure of having an in-depth, uh, slightly longer conversation with Ibarionex Perejo, and that's just the best name ever. <laughs> it's, it's something that, um, it's, it's very cool for him, because if you Google that name, then you're going to find uh, maybe one or two others, I think, but I, uh, I did it, and it's um, a unique name. He's uh, Dominican heritage, but he grew up in California. And he's the host of The Candid Frame. And what we talked about was just how he took his passion for photography and created a podcast around it that's been running now for 10 plus years. And anytime I get a chance to speak to a podcaster who's been doing it that long, you know that I gobble that up and we go deep on what motivates them, what inspires them, and what he's done to ensure that he always gets the most out of his guests. It's a really fascinating conversation. Um, it seems a bit low-key if you, when you listen to the first part of it, but uh, st- you know, stick in there um, and listen to the whole thing, really, guys. This is, this is really a lot of podcasting gold is there. You, know, you can't have someone who's been podcasting that long and not have just nuggets of wisdom to be dropping left and right. So check it out, my conversation with Ibarrio Next. Stay tuned at the end of the episode to get some more information about our podcast sponsor, Fancy Hands. If you're not familiar with Fancy Hands, then they are an online concierge service and they provide uh, tasks that you can, they, they can accomplish for you online or over the phone. I've been using them for the past three years. I just can't say enough about them. Um, and it's something that you should definitely check out. They're, they're providing the listeners of the show with a code that you can use for five free tasks to try it out. So the way I'm going to be handing those out or, or giving those away is through uh, tracking the iTunes reviews. So if you've left one several years ago or a long time ago, then you're definitely eligible to, to go in again. All you have to do is leave a review on iTunes or on Stitcher if you're an Android uh, fan and uh, just put Fancy Hands in the actual um, actual description of your review and then once a month I'll pick a name and I'll send you over the code and you can try it out and you'll rip about it just like I did so stay tuned for that and enjoy the conversation so you buy your next Perello or is it Perello uh, either way either way yeah. I'll do Perello uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna keep it Latin as much as we can <laughs> <laughs> thank you for uh, joining me on Podcast Junkies 
Oh, thanks for having me, man. It's a, it's a real pleasure. It's always interesting to um, expand my podcasting circle um, as much as I can and and sort of find a new, for me, treasure trove of podcasters. And I, I recently did that uh, at this meetup we had here locally a couple of weeks ago um, that was put together by Ben Adair. And, right. and, uh, and we, you and I started chatting. And then you started telling me about your po- about your podcast, and it, it's inevitable when you're in a room full of podcasters. It's almost like, what's the first the first question? Is, <laughs> what's your podcast, and uh, how long you've been doing it? And you told me you've been doing it ten years. So uh, I'm wondering if you've had a similar experience where you, know, you sort of think you know everyone in in the space, and then another doorway is opened, if you will, and you meet a whole group of people that you never were in contact with or knew about. You know. Um I wish I could say that because I've just been working in isolation for the longest time. Um, the other podcasters that I got to know were primarily primarily other photo podcasters. And they were in Japan, in Germany, and in uh, England. And so our relationships, and one was in Chicago. And so our relationships were always virtually. And I've met. I think two or three of them in person, um, but that that was sort of it. And because I was just for working on this one particular subject, that was really the only other podcasters that I would uh, connect with. And I I knew there were other podcasters out there, but uh, I never I, I never thought to you know start. Uh, reaching out and connecting with all these people who are doing podcasts on subject matter that didn't have something to do with photography. Um, I just, I started figuring it out myself and I just kind of went from there. So uh, I probably could have benefited by reaching out to other people early on because I made a lot of mistakes, some some more costly than others. But um yeah, I, I give uh, I give props to people who have the the sense enough to start reaching out early and and start asking questions and, and building relationships. I'm kind of late to that game. Is that something that's inherent in you? It's it's you know there's the big joke about uh, husbands with wives on trips and taking the wrong turn and then having this 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 um, need to n- never feel that they, they can ask for directions. <laughs> and I'm wondering if it's a little bit of that. I, I don't think so much that it's a male thing, but I think that as a early on in as a kid, I just got it into my head that uh, I had to figure things out myself, and uh, that uh, I couldn't. This might turn into a sort of a counseling session, <laughs> but, but yeah. something uh, early on, I felt like I couldn't afford to let people think that I didn't know what I was doing. And I couldn't afford to make mistakes. And that sort of thinking just kind of led me to just try to figure things out on my own. You know, because I just, I felt I, I, I just, I, even though I'm a grown adult and I know better than that, I think part of me was wired that way so that I would just go, I would just sit down there and I would just, especially the podcasting things, just start figuring things out. And, um, but that's changed, thankfully. Now I know that if I can't figure something out, I can probably save myself a lot of time and a lot of money and a lot of grief by uh, reaching out to someone and saying, hey, how do you do this? What am I doing wrong? And uh, that, that's a lot better way of doing things. I, well, it's also a, a function of living in an age where literally almost anything you need to get an answer on is uh, a Google search away. Yeah. Yeah, but that can take a lot of time. I mean, I use YouTube like an encyclopedia, but sometimes it's just like trying to find the one thing that you need to find out. You spend so much time. Like I was trying to, uh, I was editing something today on Audition, and my cursor started doing this weird thing, and I couldn't figure out what I'd done. And I had at some point I had to stop because I knew I would probably spend like two hours on this thing trying to figure out what this was. So I was just like, I said, that's my cue to just say, stop doing this and work on something else from right now. And then hopefully tomorrow morning, I'll, with a fresher brain, I'll be able to figure out exactly what was happening and, and, and resolve it. 
Yeah, because I think uh, that's part of the challenge to figure figure out the uh, is it the signal from the noise? Yeah, and understand where you need to go to get the answer for the specific problem you're having at that specific moment in time. But inevitably, it's a rabbit hole, right? And we get sucked into some some other YouTube videos watching something that's <laughs> Japanese origami or something like that. <laughs> Um, you, there's a lot of titles that I, that I could give you just simply from the short time I've known you and, and uh, the little I've been listening to, to some of the episodes. But it's it's storyteller, it's uh, photographer, it's podcaster, and um, and I'm wondering which one of those resonate with you uh, the most at, at this point in time. You know, it, it depends on the time of day. I mean, I get asked that all the time. What do you do for a living? And I really hate the question. Because it's like I do so many, so many things. Um, sometimes I, I, I kind of favor saying producer, you know, because I think that to some extent that's what I'm doing a, a lot of the time. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's a question that I think for the most part people really don't, aren't interested in the answer. You know, it's kind of like one of those filler questions. They're like, well, what do you do? Because that's just... Yeah. And that's and it's a question that I, I usually avoid asking just because I hate I hate being asked that question. So but but I'll answer your question anyway. <laughs> but I, I I think primarily I'm a photographer. Okay. So just I just if I love that first and foremost, going out and making photographs, that's that's my thing. And the photo and the podcasting is is really revolves around that. Not only in terms of the content of the show, but just because it it allows me uh, another means by which I can be jacked into that thing that I love so much, making pictures. So you were inspired by someone um, in in the late seventies to get started with uh, photography, right? Yeah, yeah. I was at the Boys Club of Hollywood, and uh, one of the counselors there, Mike Cohen. He was uh, uh, enjoyed photography himself, and there was a dark room at the club that had fallen into disuse, and it had an enlarger. It had the trays. Uh, it had these old cameras, like from the fifties. These basically what looked like boxes with lenses on them. They were just really old, old cameras. And he brought two photojournalists in who taught the kids how to load the camera, process the film, and make some prints. And the moment I saw that image appear on that blank sheet of paper, it was like game over. And so after a while, a lot of the other kids just lost interest in it. But for me, it was it was all I wanted to do. And so every time I would come to the club, I would ask Mike for the keys to the dark room. And I'd go into the dark room and I'd start making pictures around the club or in Hollywood or, you know, wherever. And uh, I was just I just wanted to get back into the dark room and make and make prints. And so, um, yeah, I think it was about probably about 10 years old. And, you know, after that, it was just like game over. It was like, and still now it's, it's as exciting as it was back then, even though I don't work in the dark room anymore, there's just something about making pictures and seeing, seeing the results that, that I'll never lose the, the taste or the, the excitement that I get from making, making a good photograph. And a lot of what you learned there, um, I was reminded of uh, this piece when uh, you had a, uh, someone on one of your recent episodes that talked about learning the dark room, but just as the dark room was going out of style, and and, and you, you were learning it in its heyday. But he said it was important everything that he learned there because even though he shoots, uh, um, the name is slipping me for a second, but uh, he said now that he shoots purely on digital, it's the artist that uh, the photographer that uses only the iPhone right now. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And he said, um, even though he learned the darkroom techniques and he's not using them anymore, all those techniques, the dodging and some of the other terms that I'll probably butcher, he, he, uh, he has that mindset in place. And I'm wondering if it's the same case for you, having worked so long and, and growing up with a darkroom, if, if, even though they don't exist now, if all those sensibilities come into play. Oh, yeah. Yeah. All of those things um, have played a role in... Not just the way I take the pictures, but the way that I use Photoshop or use Snapseed on my phone when I'm when I'm preparing images for Instagram. That whole sensibility in terms of how you look at a print uh, kind of informs how I massage an image in the end, like dodging and burning and being aware of things that 
like the brightest element in in the in the shot is what's going to draw someone's attention. Mm. Areas of high contrast, pattern, all of those things that you learn um, from coming from traditional analog photography applies to digital just as much. And so all of those things that I learned back then uh, inform what I do now. But I don't have to work with chemicals. I don't have to you know, work in a dark room. I do it in front of a computer instead, which... Though I don't think I'll ever go back into a dark room, there's something to be said about the distraction-free space of a dark room. Because a computer, you know, you know, there's so much stuff that can just pull you away from what you're supposed to be focusing on. But when you're in a dark room, you know, you turn on some music and you can be there for hours making prints and just lose track of time. And you are incredibly focused during that entire period. And that's something that that you really have to make a more considered, concerted effort to do when you're working on a computer because you get these notifications in the upper right-hand corner, you know, you get your phone ringing, all this other stuff. And when you walk into a dark room, you can just shut all that stuff out. So there's a digital equivalent to that. I, I've not heard of it. <laughs> it. Yeah, not a digital one because, yeah, there's this, there's so many, so few opportunities to have that meditative, uh, just isolated experience you know, that we treasure them when they happen. And, and for me, sometimes it's, uh, I use uh, Blue Apron, which is an, a, a service that sends you a food that you prepare at home and they give you recipes, picture, yeah. pictures. So I like, I, 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 I tell my wife that I can cook with instructions like a, like a chef, like a French chef. <laughs> <laughs> and she can just look, open her fridge, refrigerator door and just whip up something. So the aspect of being there following instructions, having a glass of wine, and maybe probably listening to a podcast is as close as I come to having that moment where I'm not thinking of anything else. I'm not really that distracted. But, but you, I mean, like, like to your point, is we really have to sometimes get away to a meditative retreat somewhere to not even have a phone signal to find experiences like that. Yeah. yeah. I was listening to an episode of Where There's Smoke. Um, I don't know. Have you have been listening to that podcast? No. You should. You yeah. should. It's really in line with what you're doing. It's a great, great podcast. But they were doing um, something on multitasking. Yeah. And, oh, man, I really needed to hear that because it really it spoke to the idea that, you know, people do all this multitasking and it's really making them less efficient yeah. in terms of the use of time, in terms of the actual work that they're trying to do. And um, I realized that I had fallen into that trap where I was trying to juggle three or four things simultaneously and doing really poorly with all of them. And so since I listened to that episode, I've been really trying to sort of focus on doing just one thing at a time. And uh, it, it is really hard. Yeah, it is. <laughs> really hard because I've just sort of, you know, for the last 10 or 15 years that uh, I've been using the Internet or is it more than that, I, whatever long, how long it's been, you know, that, that distraction has made you know, my ability to be able to get things done efficiently and well has been reduced as a result of all those distractions. Mm -hmm. And realize, and they talked about it in the interview about how you're much more prone to making mistakes and errors as a result of you having your mind, you know, in all these sort of different places. So when I'm sitting down, it's like I'm just trying to focus on this sort of one thing. And not allow all these other things to sort of pull me away. And there's some days where I lose miserably at that at that effort. But I think for the most part, since I've been making the the concerted effort to do just that, that I feel better about the work that I'm doing. And uh, uh, and I'm and I'm, I'm noticing that I, I'm a lot less prone to error. I can see that my errors increase when I'm when I'm not working singularly. And trying to do too many things at once. Yeah, and, and I think it's setting our, ourselves up uh, to succeed. So, for for example, on my phone, I've, I've tried to turn off almost every single alert and notification that pops yeah. up. And um, as soon as my wife gets home, I always switch it into silent because the only call that's really important for me <laughs> that I really need to hear is my is my wife is my wife's uh, when she's at work. So I'm, I actually set an alarm at around seven thirty when she leaves to turn my ringer on. And then, and so yeah. that way, I, I know because the worst is when she's trying to call me, and she's like, "I couldn't reach you." And it's, "Oh, my phone was on silent." But uh, now I just set an alarm uh, for myself to turn it on, and then I just make a note that when she's there, to turn it off to sort of 
not even be tempted with all the dings and whistles and bleeps and blurbs that, yeah. that can emanate if you're not careful. And, and then the same thing on, on online. I've tried to work with just a single tab open lately, which is a challenge because <laughs> rabbit holes lead you to another website. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm curious, um, Hollywood in the late seventies must have been an extremely interesting, interesting time oh, and place. You're gonna ask me that question. You're gonna date me. <laughs> we're 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 about the same because I uh, I I was born in 1970. So. Oh okay. All right. Yeah, you look a lot younger than <laughs> that. Well, yeah. So you may you may know. Yeah. I mean Hollywood. I mean, the way Hollywood. If you wanted to go back in the day, if you wanted to go see a movie, the only two places you could go was downtown and Hollywood. That was it. They were all, there weren't these multiplexes. They weren't, they, there wasn't that choice. So if you wanted to go to movies, you either went downtown or you went to Hollywood. And if you went downtown, you were going to these movie palaces that were showing all these old, uh, n not old films, but, you know, films that uh, that weren't the latest. They were the kung fu movies. They were yeah. the movies. So we would go down there and watch like three or four Bruce Lee movies or, you know, all these all these horror movies. And then you go to Hollywood to see the, like the latest, latest releases. Um, and Hollywood was was really interesting then because then now Hollywood is all about South Hollywood, Hollywood and Highland, that sort of intersection where the. Uh, Kodak Theater, oh, yeah. where it is now, is. And it seems like it's all about that intersection. But back then, it was the entire street. You know, that, that, that was an entire theater, uh, literally on the street, in terms of the people and people hanging out. So you would go from, you know, Hollywood and Highland all the way down to, like, Vine, probably to that Pantages Theater. And there would just be hundreds, hundreds of people walking up and down the street. You know, hanging out, and you had everything. You had, you know, you had the oddballs, and then you had the normal families, and they were all just mixed up, and it was just a really sort of fascinating, fascinating place. And I go to Hollywood now, and most of the street, there's hardly anybody walking outside of that one, that one center, Hollywood and Highland. And I, you know, it was it's just a very different beast now. So it's I don't go there very much. I I'll, I teach some photo uh, photography workshops and, and through uh, LACP, Los Angeles Center of Photography, which is based in Hollywood, not too far from there. So every every other class session, I'll, I'll take people around Hollywood to go and, and shoot practice street photography. Uh, but for the most part, I've taken downtown because downtown for me holds much more interest than, than Hollywood does. Yeah, I think the, the best correlation for me, having moved from New York uh, two years ago, is Times Square, uh, yeah. and Times Square in the seventies and eighties was just a completely different oh, beast. <laughs> man, you get off of Forty Second Street near the Greyhound station. Back in the day, <laughs> yeah. you can just like run. <laughs> Once you get off that subway station, you better move fast. You uh, don't want to you're on that corner. That Port Authority. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so did the did being in the in the boys club keep you out of trouble? Uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, for the most part, yeah, yeah. I think it was. I was. I was never the kind of kid to get into trouble. Uh, I was, you know, once I got into school, I was. I was happy to be in a library or in front of a television set. Hmm. So for me, the boys club just gave me options beyond that because I think I was just. I was. I was always pretty much a, a loner. My brothers were better in terms of making friends and mm -hmm. interacting with all these other other kids in the neighborhood, and I wasn't particularly good at sports, so it was like, yeah, I'll just go to the library and 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 you know and read books, and that for me was was best. But when I got to the boys' club, it was it was a, a place where I could feel a little more comfortable interacting with other people. Y your your relationships were built around all the activities you had. You know, you you play billiards, you could play foosball, you could be up in the library, you could, you know, um, you know, playing games, you could be in the arts and crafts room making arts and crafts, you could be out in the pool swimming. So your relationships are built largely by all these activities. So for me, it was really easy because I had some choice there, unlike school, where that whole hierarchy about, you know, you know, who ranks. Yeah comes into play and Click, I felt, clicks and all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't feel that at the boys clubs. It was, it was, um, 
as far as my my uh, my ability to interact with other people, I think it was probably healthiest when I was at the at the club. Outside of there, man, I was pretty useless. <laughs> um, do you think that your experience with the boys' club has uh, colored your your experiences now that you're older, in so much as you look for opportunities to mentor other 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 younger kids? No, not really. I mean, my wife and I, we don't have any kids. And other than my godchildren, um, there have really not been a whole lot of kids in our lives. I, I have taught photography to kids uh, mm -hmm. on occasion. But, uh, yeah, yeah, I've not made mentorship of, of kids um, a real part of my life. Other than, you know, when I, I'm, I'm teaching at the art center. Because as far as I'm concerned, those are kids. <laughs> They're all in their early 20s, and they probably wouldn't appreciate that. But uh, but to, to a certain extent, um, I, I, always, I always feel like I'm still a kid trying to learn so much mm. that I never really think about the fact that, that my experience is, would be of value to somebody else. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it's, one day I was going out with a bunch of other photographers to go out and shoot. And they wanted to come shoot with me. And so I just started taking pictures and then they started asking me, what are you looking at? What are you photographing? And it was like, I, at that moment I realized they weren't seeing how I was seeing. They didn't understand what I was doing. And I started explaining it to them. And that's when I started, started teaching photography because I just didn't get that. What I knew other people didn't know. Mm -hmm. I had just been I just been figuring it out by myself, doing it by myself for so long that uh, I thought that everybody else did that. So I, I I was always thinking about what I didn't know, or what my pictures didn't look like, or mm. what I wasn't achieving. So I always saw myself at sort of uh, a beginning level with with that because I was always looking at people who I was aspiring to, not thinking that there are other people who've picked up a camera. Uh, a lot later than I have, for whom all this stuff is new. Yeah. So having that, that and I had that same experience with, with podcasting when I went to that uh, podcast conference. All of a sudden, they're talking about all this stuff, and I'm going, what do you mean you don't know all this? <laughs> I know that. <laughs> I've been doing this for 10 years. I mean, how do you not know this? But, you know. You know, when you're not when you're not interacting with people on a regular basis, and you're working in isolation all the time, it's really easy to lose perspective on on your experience and your skill and 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 assigning a value to it. So then, it must be reassuring when you do get out into the wild, so to speak, <laughs> and start to interact, and, and and you realize that you've you've learned a lot along the way, whether it's podcasting or whether it's uh, photography, and that you do have something of value to add. As a result of all the experience you have. Oh yeah, yeah. It it does boost my confidence when I do realize that you know, I have a certain set of skills. <laughs> Who? What's the, your earliest recollection of a photographer that you looked up to or admired? Oh, the earliest. I really can't remember. Um, I think that. When I started really seriously looking at pictures was in college. And I went to school at Berkeley. I got a degree in English Lit. Uh, and I used to go to a bookstore called Moe's Bookstore on Telegraph Avenue. And I would go there to buy used photo books. And that was my photo education because I never really took any classes. But I started looking at these photo books that I was able to get for really, really cheap. And I would just look at the work like of Mary Ellen Mark, uh, William Albert Allard, uh, Eugene Richards, Gordon Parks. And I started looking at these photographs and I was just like going, wow, oh my God, this is what people can do with a camera. I think the one, the, yeah, and, and I remember, um, what's his name? Um, Gregory Heisler. I think he was the first photographer who, who ever made an, a, a wow impression on me. And I was going to LACC, and I was working on the Collegian newspaper. 
And Sports Illustrated came out with this article in which it was focusing on uh, Muhammad Ali and his entourage. And Gregory Heisler had made these black and white portraits of Ali and, and the man who had been his coach and the person, guy who had been his masseuse. And I remember looking at those pictures and just being awestruck. Hmm. And I think it was the first time that I looked at pictures and I was like, oh, my God, someone can make this with a camera? Because before then, it was just it was just pictures. But when I looked at that, it suddenly became art. It became something so much more than I ever had imagined that it could be. It reminds me of the, uh, the comment that uh, uh, Robert Fisher made in, I think, the latest episode of the difference between pictures versus images. Is that what you're alluding yeah. to? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, I, was, I was, you know, I picked up a camera. I was taking pictures of my family, but then I, I liked roaming the streets. I remember going to Venice Beach and making pictures there because when we would go to outings with my family, I was always snapping away, taking pictures and giving giving my family rolls of film to go pay for the processing for. And, when, and thankfully, my parents were pretty accommodating with respect to that. Um, so it was just, I would just see things that I would just make pictures of them. Of them. And then I would look at the prints and, and, but mostly I was trying to document things and trying to make them look good. I don't think I was ever thinking about what I was trying to say. I think I had I had a, I had an idea of what a good picture looked like, and I was just trying to achieve that. And sometimes I I I think at least for the for the most part during that time, I knew when I, I I succeeded. But it wasn't until I started seeing great photographs that I really had an understanding that this medium it can be so much more than what I had imagined it to be. When when you say you could you could see an uh, image and know that you succeeded. What was it about the photograph that separated it from all the other previous pictures you had taken on that subject, for example? You know, I think, I think it was the fact that I was able to see all the crap and get rid of it while I was making the picture. I think that, that was, it, was, it was developing a way of seeing that mm. was really kind of critical. Cause, uh, and everyone has experienced this. You, you, take, you see something, you take a picture, and then you get the print, print back, and then you're going... Oh, I didn't see all this other crap. I didn't see this white car in the corner. I didn't see this tree you know, growing out of this person's head. You know, I was so sure that I had a great shot, but because I wasn't paying attention, um, the photograph wasn't what I had, didn't capture what I felt at the moment that I snapped the, the shutter release. And I think what that when I started to be able to s see the print, in my mind's eye, when I was looking through the viewfinder, when I could see the finished photograph and see everything in the frame and say, okay, I keep this, I get rid of this. I need to shift to the left, I need to shift to the right, I need to move closer, I need to further back. All of those things, all those informed choices, when that started happening to me and my photographs became better, that's when I felt things click for me. And then, you know, things uh, became more refined later as I started paying more attention to light and shadow and shape, form, and all this other stuff. Um, all that stuff started making making me better because it because what made me a better photographer had nothing to do with the camera. That was just the means by which I recorded what I was seeing. It was the seeing that was first and foremost the the the, the priority. So you're saying that you. You always had the eye and working through photography, just you were able to bring that, that aspect of you, of you out? I think to some extent, we're, we already, everybody has an eye. I mean, everybody knows what a good picture is. I mean, we grow up looking at pictures all the time. So we have this encyclopedia in our head that tells us, well, this is what a good picture looks like. Mm -hmm. And then we make the photographs, and then they suck. And it's kind of like, okay, how do we bridge the gap between um, what I know a good picture is and what I'm doing? And so I think that 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 comes through a, just a lot of a lot of shooting, making a lot of bad photographs. And then you start looking at your photographs that don't work, or I look at my photographs that don't work, and I go, okay, why doesn't it work? Well, it's because 
the lighting's bad, or it's because I included this thing in the frame, or I just didn't t- time it properly, or there was this juxtaposition of these elements uh, that at that, that split second just don't work. Um, it's all these considerations that that now happen for me within milliseconds. Mm. I'm seeing this stuff. I'm seeing on the street, and I can anticipate moments. You know, I see the light. I see the setting. I go, okay, I'm going to stand here because the overall frame of this scene looks pretty good. But now I need something, and I'll wait for someone to walk into the frame, and I'll try and time it so that they're at the exact same exact spot where I need them to be, and I'll make the picture. And it happens, but more more often than not, I'm missing missing it. I mean, I post daily on Instagram, but you know, um, of that one picture that I decided to post, I may have taken three dozen or a hundred photographs that didn't work. Mm. You know, so it's this constant practicing, this constant refinement that happens to me on on the street that uh, is all in the pursuit of. Getting one image in which everything converges together and it just happens. And it's like, it's elusive, but that's, that's half the fun for me. And, and is it safe to assume that that's always a, a trait that you're just going to be looking to Im- improve as, for as long as you live? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've been shooting in Westlake um, near MacArthur Park. And because uh, that's what the studio is for maximum fun. And so uh, during my lunch breaks or during my breaks, I go out and for about 15 or 20 minutes and I go out and shoot. And so I'm, I'm pushing myself every day to do something different. You know, I'm working with um, a camera that has the equivalent of a 24 millimeter lens, which is really wide. And for the last seven months, uh, I've been shooting with primarily that and for the longest time, I used to shoot with a 35 millimeter or a 50. So shooting with a wide angle has a whole new set of challenges. Uh, you know, you're including much more in the frame. So you have to be that much more aware of what's happening at the periphery, what's happening at the edges. Um, you have to work closer than you normally would with a 50 millimeter lens. Uh, because you need that prox- proximity, that immediacy. So I can't shoot at five to seven feet away if I want to get the kind of shot. I need to move in three feet, four feet closer, mm-hmm. which since I'm photographing people on the street, adds a level of discomfort for me, you know, to get past that level of discomfort and really push myself and get in closer. And, you know, it's, and it's, and because I'm in the same neighborhood and I'm not really, um, walking very far there's a really small area that i'm returning to over and over again to shoot that i have to keep a a set of fresh eyes on so that that area can be revealed to me in a different way than it was yesterday or the week before Mm. that i'm not just looking at it in the same way and making the same shots because every time i'm going out there i i don't want to go out there and repeat myself and so so all of those things, are, I'm pushing myself, trying to become um, not only a better photographer, but a different photographer than who I was a year ago. Yeah, there's so much that can be taken from what you said in terms of always trying to have a, a fresh set of eyes, even if you keep encountering the same experience all over again. And I, I remember that I was listening to uh, some of the episodes as I was walking around the block with my dog. And I always walk around the same block. Mm-hmm. And as you were touching upon that topic, you were, you were talking to Michelle uh, Groskov. Yeah, yeah. And it was about, uh, uh, you know, just, you were talking about the intimacy of getting close <laughs> with, 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 um, with your subject. Um, but what you, you, what you were talking about now was really resonating with me because I could take a hundred trips around the block. And if I don't have a, 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 a fresh set of eyes or a wider perspective, or look in different directions every single time, you know, then I'm going to, I'm going to think that I'm seeing the same thing over and over when in fact, I just need to point my eyes in different directions and I'll never get tired of things to, to photograph in this example, or just to look at, or just to think about. Yeah. Cause there's, there's always stuff to photograph. I mean, when I was younger, I would have all this equipment and I'd go out and come back home and, and say, Oh, there was nothing to shoot. And now I know it was just like, no, there was plenty of stuff to shoot. I just didn't see it. Yeah. 
And so anytime I go out, I know there are photographs that are out there. And always, no matter what, no matter what the weather, no matter what the quality of the light, no matter what's happening on the street, there is always a photograph around me. And the challenge is, am I going to be in a state of mind where I'll, I'll be able to see it? Mm. Where I'm free of all that clutter in my head, all the noise, all the distractions, um, where I can suddenly see the potential of a moment and, and make a shot. I have a shot in my Instagram that I shot, I think, a couple of weeks ago of this guy crossing uh, of the crosswalk. And the crosswalk has these really wide yellow bars that go across the, uh, the length of the, the, the street. Yeah. And I was about to, and it was one of those days where it was, I felt like I wasn't going to get any, any pictures. And uh, I was about to cross the street and I saw how the light was cutting through the crosswalk, splitting it in half. So half of the, these yellow bars are in shadow and the other was, was in, was in light. And I went, oh, this is really interesting. And then I saw this other guy waiting to cross the street opposite me. And so I just prayed that he would walk on the bright side. And thankfully he did. And then I just got this shot where he, where he was about midway through and his foot is just about to, you know, step on the ground. And, you know, and, and there it was. And it was the most obvious and mundane scene possible, right? It's just a crosswalk. But because I was able to see the light, see the shadow, see the pattern, you know, because I don't know if I would have seen that a couple of years back because mm. I would have been preoccupied with the fact that for the past 20 minutes, I didn't get any good photographs. Yeah, you, you would have been and, in your head. Yeah, I would have gone, oh, man, I didn't get a damn thing. And now I've just got to get back to the office and do some more work. And I would have missed that moment. But I was open enough, even though I was frustrated up to that point, to all of a sudden, oh, wait, there's something here. And, you know, and able to make the shot. A lot of the, the traits that you mention in in being um, or becoming a, a better photographer are things that I imagine are applicable in your in your real life and in in your day to day. And I'm, and I'm wondering how has photography and what you've learned over the years in, enhanced your personal life, in, in not related to photography. You know. Um I, you know, I would like to say that that photography made me a better person, but I don't think it 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 did. I I can say that more about podcasting than I can photography. Um, because I think that that in terms of um, how our phrases um. You know, going back to this idea of having no really real perspective of who you are and what your skill sets are and all this other stuff. Uh, I'd been doing photography for so long, I really had no perspective on that. But then when I started doing the, the, the podcast, I started realizing that I had that, that knowledge of photography, my ability to be able to interview people, my ability to listen, um, my enthusiasm and my love and passion for it that I could create something that really resonated with people who I didn't know. Hmm. And because my photography was primarily done for myself, and I really, other than the stuff that I was doing for the magazine articles, I really never got any much feedback to that stuff. I mean, I mean the circulations for these magazines were in the hundreds of thousands, but I never heard back from people who read these things. You know, I get my byline, the magazine go out, and then I, I was working on the next two. So I had no no perspective at all on on what I was doing, but podcast was completely different. And then all of a sudden, I started realizing that this thing that I had started primarily as 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 an excuse to talk to photographers that I really wanted to talk to and talk shop with them and to learn from them that this thing uh, had could hold meaning and have value to a bunch of people who I would never meet. And I think that that um, gave me a much healthier appreciation about who I was and what I was doing, more so than photography, because I was, I was sharing it. And I think that was one of the unintentional benefits of it. And it just started, it helped me to feel better about myself and who I was. Mm. You know, because I, I, I saw that other people 
uh, saw a value in it. And I think that, you know, when you're in a bubble, you have no perspective. Yeah. You know, people can say, oh, yeah, that's a nice picture. But, you know, for me, most of those people had no understanding in terms of what I was doing or what I was trying to do. You know, but all of a sudden there was a, a community out there that really understood what I was I was trying to achieve. And were telling me, you know, you're on the right path. You're doing the right, you know, you're doing really good work here. It's like, oh. And, and when that's, st- and those messages start coming from Japan, from Australia, from Chile, and I'm going, oh, oh crap, people are actually listening to this thing. <laughs> it's a nice feeling. Oh, yeah, it's wonderful. What, um, who was the inspiration or what was the inspiration for starting the podcast? Well, I was listening to podcasts, I think, before iTunes showed up. Yeah. And so I was, I think, I think one of the applications I was using was Lemon. And there were a couple of different, um, different ones out there. And I was commuting from the west side to Pasadena. And so that was like an hour to go to work, an hour and a half to go back. And so when I found out about podcasts, I was like, oh, this is better than books on tape. And so I just started listening to whatever was out there. Um, And I was just listening to it. I forget the names of most of the podcasts that I was listening to back then, but I was... Uh, I think Don and Drew was one of the ones. I think they were the real, one of the er- real early podcasters, or husband and wife couple. I don't know if they're still podcasting or not, but I remember that they were. Um, uh, who's the guy who's the considered the Podfather? Um, Adam Adam Curry. Adam Curry. Mm-hmm. I remember listening to his podcast, and so I was just listening to all this stuff. But I started listening to the photo podcast, and at the time, I think it was Chris Marquardt who does Tips from the Top Floor. There was Jeff Curto, who does the history of photography. Uh, and then there was uh, Martin um, Martin Bailey out of Japan, who was doing the Martin Daly Photography Podcast. And I think these, and a, there were a bunch of other ones. But I was subscribing to all the photo podcasts. And I think most of the shows were talking about equipment and gear. And because I was working at a magazine where I was writing about that stuff all the time, I was like, man, this is such a missed opportunity because these people are just talking about equipment, but nobody's talking about photography. So I felt like, I know all these photographers. I know how to interview people. Let me, let me learn how to do this and put out a show. And I, and I remember the moment I was stuck in traffic when the idea for the show popped into my head and the name of the show popped into my head, The Candid Frame. I went, oh, that sounds really cool. And I was like, you know, out loud in the car going, this is the candid frame. This is the candid frame. <laughs> and just repeating the title and thinking, wow. And it, it was one of the few moments where I felt like if I do this, it will be successful. Hmm. Now, I didn't attach what that success would look like. I just knew it would, it would work. And so I just started, you know, researching how to, how to record a podcast. A friend of mine lent me his digital recorder, um, I, he lent me a mic, you know, uh, to, to record the stuff. I was recording on GarageBand. Um, I remember going into my closet several times to record my, my, my audio, you know, cause, and all that stuff. And I just started, I just started putting it out there and, and figuring things out. And God knows I made plenty of mistakes. I mean, I can't listen to some of those episodes because the audio quality is such, such crap. You know, but it is what it is. And and I tell people that I'm so glad that I started doing the podcast then rather than now, because there was nothing really to compare it to back then. It was completely new. So I wasn't looking at my show in comparison to what somebody else was doing. There was no, no one else out there doing an interview show about photography. So... I didn't have to worry about me being falling falling short because I'm comparing myself unfavorably to somebody else, which was incredibly liberating. Yeah. So I could just go out and play and try to figure this out, and and uh, and then you know I'm still here doing it now. I think uh, part of the benefit may have been that you had, uh, like you said, friends and colleagues that were. Um, photographers that you wanted to speak to and 
did that make those initial conversations that much easier? Because there's a lot of things you need to, to learn when you're when you start podcasting, and a lot of things you need to be aware of and conscious of as to whether you're doing them right or not, and yeah. and least of not which is the actual interview of, 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 the, of the person. So I'm wondering if that maybe helped a bit. Well, with, I was working at um, Warner Publishing, who publishes Outdoor Photographer, Digital Photo Pro Magazine, and Digital Photo Magazine. And so I was used to interviewing people because I would take those interviews and I would write the magazine articles from them. So interviewing someone really wasn't the challenge that it probably is for other people who are starting a show and don't have that experience. I'd been doing it, you know, for about seven or eight years. So I felt really comfortable uh, interviewing someone. And because I was talking about something I knew a lot about, it also helped take the edge. So most of my, so when I would sit down and talk to someone on the show, uh, it was, it was, it came pretty naturally to me. And, and I didn't work from a list of questions. You know, I would just have some notes on, you know, a couple of words on a sheet of paper. And then I would just let the, and I still do it that way. And I just let the conversation just go sort of naturally. And I know there are certain points I want to hit, but I don't, the one, the one thing I did learn pretty early on uh, was that the first question is critical. Hmm. And because a lot of the people that I would interview, particularly people who uh, are really recognized photographers who have been interviewed countless times, um, have pat answers that they can give you. And I didn't want that from the conversations. I want to get something new from them. I, did, I wanted people listening to interviews with these photographers and go, you know, something I've heard, heard uh, have heard him or her talk about photography photography in the career before I've read all the articles, but, um, I've never heard that from them before. And so I learned that the first question was really essential because a lot of people, when I listen to other interviews, the first question is, how do you get started in photography? You know, which is like, you know, pull a bullet in my head sort of <laughs> question, right? Yeah. But I, I made the effort that's like, okay, I need to really think about what my first question is because it's going to set the tone. It's going to let them know that this is not, oh, this person knows something about me. Oh, this person knows what they're talking about. Oh, this conversation is not going to be um, what I think it's going to be. You know, I, that people have to think about their answers mm -hmm. as opposed to just giving, regurgitating answers that they've given countless number of other writers and interviewers before. And I think I've been pretty successful in being able to do that because people joke that on my show that almost every episode someone says, "Oh, that's a good question," you know. And when I hear that, I go, "Okay, that's good. I'm, I'm, I'm on the right path." But yeah, that was that was sort of the key, trying to figure out what that first question is going to be, and um, and and listening. Listening is absolutely essential because the follow-up question is often really key. You know, and because as the conversation goes on, they'll say something and that will that will fire a synapse in my brain and go, OK, I need to ask this question about about that or or take the conversation in this in this direction. And that's fun for me. I, I like the interviews. It's it's really um, I think it's really enjoyable, um, especially when I'm able to interview someone in person, which is the exception rather than the rule. Most of my conversations happen on Skype. But, you know, uh, but I, I think it's probably been good that most of my conversations have been on Skype because I think it's heightened my, my interview skills to the point that I'm a much better listener and I'm really in tune with what people are saying. Because I usually, I'm, I'm, when you heard the episodes, I don't really intrude in the conversation. Yeah. You know, I kind of like people, I let people just kind of, kind of go in there. If I interrupt people, it's pretty rare for me to sort of jump in. Um, but I think that's worked, um, to my benefit because the episodes go out largely unedited for the most part. Um, I, 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 I think about, especially because of all the experience I've been having working on uh, bullseye, uh, and how, uh, edited that show is. Yeah. Sometimes I think hmm, there's certain advantages to, 
um, editing a, a showdown uh, and just keeping the really good stuff. But that's more work. And even though I have an editor that does the show for me, who cuts the show for me, I, I, I wonder, I wonder really whether I want to go to uh, having a show that's structured in in that way. There's some some certain advantages to just letting it just be what it is. Yeah, there's an aspect to a conversation that just continues um, and is engaging that to the listener sounds a bit more realistic and it's as if you're sitting in the room. Yeah. And I kind of let, kind of let go of my vanity because sometimes I used to stutter. I still stutter a little bit, but I had the bad stutter when I was a little kid. And sometimes it shows up in, in, when I'm asking a question because I'm formulating it and, and out of vanity sometimes I want to go in there and just like fix it. But, you know, I kind of... I, I let it be. It is what it is. There seems to be a new, uh, I was going to say newfound, but I don't know. Maybe it's always been there. Appreciation for uh, hearing a podcaster, warts and all, <laughs> on, an, on an interview or in a show, because I think there's people that are drawn to that. And I think I've, I've had cases where listeners have commented on some of my episodes that where I'm, I make a mistake or I've got some the squeaking of my chair or my yeah. dog barking and, and they just they sort of can relate to it. So I think, um, something for everyone, right? Different strokes for different folks. And yeah, I think there's some, something to be said for something that's authentic. Mm -hmm. you know, it's the, and, uh, if people take that away from my show, uh, I'm, I'm more than pleased to, to do it. I mean, this as as much as I appreciate shows that are really polished, especially a lot of the shows that are coming out now, the, the production values are just really amazing. Yeah, and I, I listen to those shows, and I and, and and this is like episode one, right? And I'm like, damn, <laughs> really good. But you know, does my would, does my show become a better thing because I do I put in that kind of work and make those kind of changes? I don't know if that's really the reason why people listen to my program. I don't think it is. So if I go to that. Who am I really doing it for? You know, if people are really happy, I think when people are happiest is when they listen to a show and they're not only inspired, but they gain some sort of insight, not only about the person I'm interviewing, but something about themselves and the way they're, they're practicing photography. Bottom line, that's why there's value to my show and why so many people listen to the program. And that's where I need to keep the, the focus. All these other things might be nice, but they really can't be the priority. Anything that sort of takes away from that, that, that ultimate ideal, that ultimate goal, has to be put by, by the wayside. So, Have you ever been uh, star, starstruck? With, uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I interviewed Mary Ellen Mark about two years ago, and she sadly passed away last year. So I was really grateful that I had the chance to interview her. And I remember driving to the west side because she was staying at a hotel in uh, near the Beverly Center. And I was so nervous going there to talk to her. Oh, my God. And I interviewed her uh, in a restaurant in the, in the hotel where she was having breakfast. So we had all the ambient sounds you know, going there. And I just remember, oh, my God. Because I, 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 had, I had schooled myself looking at her pictures. Looking at those, sitting in my, sitting in my room in college and looking at her pictures over and over and over and over again. I mean, I went to an exhibit and I looked at all these, uh, these these photographs and I knew the stories behind all of them. The the uh, the, the docent or whatever you call those people that take people around the tour. Yeah. You know, they were talking about it and I was like, I I so much wanted to jump in, and take over and tell them. Oh, this is tiny, or this is you know during your time, uh, you know taking pictures of, of of these prostitutes in India, and this is what she had to go through in order to make the pictures. I mean, I knew so much about her, and then to sit there right across from her, and converse with her and talk over there, I was just like, oh my god, it was. I, I was star struck, starstruck the entire time. <laughs> and the other one is William Albert Allard, who's another one of those guys who I just think is. Is, is, is a photographer a lot of people don't know about. Photographers know about him, 
but he's probably one of the most amazing color photographers uh, out there. And uh, his stuff is just fantastic. And I remember calling, calling him over Skype and conducting the interview with him. And it was like, oh, wow. And there have been several you know, people where I sit down and I go, I can't believe I'm talking to this person. You know, this is so cool. And I go, this show is providing me the means for, for me to talk to some of these people. Yeah. It's, it's really, really awesome. That's one of the big benefits is that I get to, not only do I get to talk to these people, but they see me as a peer, which is freaking awesome, you know. Which, which is a testament to the passion you've had for your subject matter and the, you know, the, the homework and the research you've put in all these years so that when you, you know, they say that uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. So when given the opportunity to, to, to speak to these people, I think everything you've done up until this point has put you in a position where you're going to get the most out of that experience as opposed to having met them casually or, or not having the podcast or running into them. And, and I think it just makes for a much more enriching moment when it does happen. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, cause nothing is more frustrating to hear an interview with someone who, you know, could give a great interview. And then you hear a, a piss poor interviewer asking them questions and it's like, oh. and, um, that's what was one of the reasons I, I, I've, I'm really enjoying working on Bullseye because I think Jesse is probably one of the best interviewers out there. He's really, really, really good. Yeah. I mean, there's it's Terry Gross, obviously, um, and and a Charlie Rose, and just a bunch of other other people, really good interviewers. But Jesse, especially so, and it's been interesting to to work on the show because I get to hear the entire conversation, which usually runs about an hour. And I'm having to edit that, edit that down anywhere between 18 to 24 minutes or something like that for, for the radio show. So having a chance to not only hear his, his questions and how he engages his subjects, and then later on how that's all refined into what ends up being on air, it's fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. And um, I, mean, I was editing um, an episode for next week, which was um, Michael, um, I think it's Michael K. Williams or Michael A. Williams, who used to be on uh, The Wire. And that was probably one of the best interviews I've heard Jesse do the entire time I've been listening to the show. This is awesome. And then sitting down there and putting it together, and, you know, and cutting it together and making my notes and, you know, editing it down. It's like I'm listening to this and I'm going, oh, my God, this is so awesome. And it really is inspiring to me in terms of, of not only how an interview is conducted, but who you need to choose in order to get a really good interview. Because... You know, my, my shows, I think, for the most part, are good, but there are certain shows that I think are, are really good. And I think that when people have a story to tell, then the conversation can go, can go, can go to do places where it doesn't, when someone really doesn't have a story to, to tell. Um, because I talk about with photographers all the time, um, some of the conversation can not so much be talking. We, we, I don't talk about gear or equipment on my show, mm -hmm. but we can talk about some general things about the practice and leading a creative life and the business of photography. But if I can get someone to talk about their lives or their work in a way that's really revealing or really interesting or that offers some surprises, that's a really good, that's a really good conversation. And, you know, when I start thinking about the people that I would like to interview, I, I think that's one of the things I'm really hunting for. It's like, is there something about this person that I'm really not just curious about, but I think will solicit uh, surprises. A conversation where I'll get something that I'm not expecting. Mm -hmm. 
Because it's one thing to interview someone and you've done all your research and you have all these questions and you kind of have a general idea how they're going to respond to these questions. Especially because I've interviewed so many photographers. It's like, you know, I can, I can anticipate what the answer will likely be. But if I can get someone who surprises me, that gives me unexpected responses, that, that is going to take the conversations in directions where I, I might not anticipate it would go, that for me would be an interesting ride. Hmm. So um, it's really hard now because I'm working full time in order to be able to do all the research that I need to do in terms of being able to you know, filter through all the different people that I'm trying to, to get. But I think that's one of the things that I'm, I'm really kind of focusing on, especially for the, in the next year, is trying to be like, okay, who do I really want to talk to? And, 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 and once I've chosen them, really pursuing them and trying to make that happen, because usually the people who are the most interesting to talk to are the most elusive to, to know that. <laughs> yeah. And, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out. Yeah, I'm sure if you continue on the path that you're, that you're on, I think the, the opportunities will present themselves. Um, and I think the word, word is, is already out in the, in the photography community about what a pleasure it is to be on your show, just from the comments that you hear the guests ha make when they're, when yeah. they're speaking with you and that they're honored to be on and, and they listen to all the time. So that's, that's a nice thing for a podcaster to hear, right? So, you know, that people enjoy the show. And it helps me because, you know, they, they, one of the first things they ask is, who else has been on the show? And yeah. I, got, I got this roster of master photographers that are on there. So it's like, oh, they've been on the show? Yes, they have been on the show. So you should be too. And you don't want to miss out. Um, what was it about the Jesse Thorne interview that sort of, as you were listening to it, made you sort of, you know, kind of stand up and, or sit up in your chair and say, well, this is, this is really good? When, when is this show coming out? Uh, next week. Next week? Okay. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, so they, that episode is going to come out on Monday, so I can, I can, I, I can talk about it. Um, he, uh, he gets this guy to cry. Mm. <laughs> and this guy, this guy, he played Omar on The Wire, and I've not watched the show except for a couple of episodes. And... He just played a song that just brought all these memories up for, for Michael. And it was, it was like the most amazing, um, genuine moment I've heard in so long. Because you hear so many conversations, so many interviews, and you realize how rare it is for someone to be genuine. Mm. Be authentic, be real, be vulnerable. And this man was that uh, on this interview, and it was like, and so I, and, and so I feel really honored that I get to, I, I'm, I'm working on this, because I can imagine when people are in their cars listening to this thing, you know, how they're going to respond to it, and it's exciting, but it's it's a rare thing, which I think it's a good thing, because I think it, it makes it all the more special. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I and it's not just, and it's not not just that he was crying. It was just that he was genuine. And I think that's one of the appeals of podcasting is the fact that that you know with so much radio and television, everyone is so everything is so controlled. Yeah. You know, everything is, is has this agenda. And then when you hear someone who's just like, um. You know, because the, the woman you said you interviewed from The Stranger. Um, Leah Tao. Leah Tao. Yeah. I mean, when she did that series about her relationships, I... That was intense. Whew, <laughs> man. I was like, damn. <laughs> I, I was re-listening to one of those episodes uh, uh, just last week. And it was... I, even the second time around, it was yeah. like... Even though, you, you, even though when you know what's coming... <laughs> <laughs> And I go, and you realize how, how little of that we have in our lives. Yeah. Even though we all feel that, even though we all experience that, have these feelings, feel these moments of vulnerability, of self-doubt, of, of excitement, how everyone is playing their cards so close to their vest. 
And I think people who are creative uh, are especially, especially sensitive with respect to that. Mm -hmm. But you don't often hear that side of themselves revealed in, in conversations. And not that I want every guest that I have on my show blubbering <laughs> by the end of it. But if I, if I can, and I think this is one of the challenges for me, is, is, is being able to get something genuine from them as part of the conversation, which is hard when you're doing stuff over Skype. Yeah. But it's a challenge that I, I kind of embrace because I think, you know, if, if you're engaging with someone else, um, whether it's in face-to-face -face or over the computer, it's possible. But I think you have to make a lot of choices leading up to that. And I think, as I said before, who you choose, you know, what you know about them, all the research that's involved, thinking about, you know, uh, what your initial question is going to be, and then just listening. Yeah. Because I think people, people unintentionally reveal themselves when they're talking about themselves, especially for an extended period of time. You'll hear something and you'll go, oh, wait, what? Go back to this. What's this about? Yeah, and they'll usually mention it like nonchalantly. <laughs> you have to right. And if listened. you really are in tune and you're really listening, you can do a follow up and sort of go, well, wait, 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 wait. Why this? Why do you have this perspective on it? That's kind of odd, don't you think? It's like, oh, I never thought about that. And then, okay, oh, okay, well, well let's talk about that. Let's figure that out. And then it can be really fun. And, and then people can relate to someone. I think that's one of the, the, the things about um, when I get photographers on my show who are really accomplished, you know, who really have this pedigree, and people hear something that they feel that they can relate to, even though they may not be at that level or have, you know, have photographed the queen or presidents and all this other stuff, but I go, wow, not only did I learn something, but I have a greater appreciation for what they did, for they, what they do and what they did. And it makes me think about what I'm doing in a different way. It gives me an appreciation for what I'm doing. And if people can take away that from a conversation, then, then I, I've kind of succeeded in what I'm trying to do on, on the show. Do you ha find that you have conversations in real life with the same level of intimacy that you've grown to have on your show? That's a good question. Um, no, but I'm working on it. I think then that, that with the interviews, I'm less self-conscious. Like at that mixer we went to, I was very self-conscious. <laughs> Right? Why? Because it, it, I'm, I'm, I'm around a bunch of people I don't know. So I start thinking about what they think of me. Mm. You know, how are they perceiving me? You know, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say because I don't want to come off as stupid. Or, you know, I don't want to, you know, have an awkward conversation. Um, I, you know, I'm just, you know, making all these calculations. But when I'm sitting across... Um, you know, I have the mic in my mouth. I'm not concerned with any of that. None of that is, is a factor for me at all. You know, it's just like, hey, I want to talk to you. I have some questions for you. I'm really curious about you. And it's like, what they think of me doesn't matter at all. Secondary. Yeah. I mean, you're on my show. Now I can ask you all these questions. I've got, I've got complete license to, to pry into your life, into your work. And I'm just going to. You know, I'm in control to, to some degree, you know, but you put me in a, in a social environment and a bunch of people I don't know. I'm like, ah. <laughs> well, you got out of your comfort zone enough to attend the event. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it really was, it was like, okay, just put, put my feelings aside and just go up and start talking to people. And that's what I did. And I think that was, um, more successful than in, than it has been in the past, you know, to be able to just talk to people. And the fact is, there are a bunch of other podcasters here. Yeah. 
you know? Oh, and wow. so, you know, it's not like other social situations where, you know, uh, you don't share something in common. Everyone here is a podcaster or wants to podcast. So it makes talking a lot easier. And, yeah. and, that's, and that's what I was reminding myself. Everybody's here for the same reason. So don't sweat it. You know, and just, just open your mouth. And it was like, oh, okay. So I managed to have a good time, but uh, I'll enjoy when I'm a lot more relaxed. Or have, have a drink in your hand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, one of the things that helped me when I was younger is I took an acting class, and he made it a point to really put us in uncomfortable situations. Okay. And it's, you know, one of the things I, I took it for about three years, and he, I remember him telling me one day that he was crossing the street one time, and he saw someone that he had had a big fight with, and he had to make a decision whether he was going to cross the street or stay on the same side of the street that the guy was coming on. And yeah. he made a conscious decision to stay on that side because he knew it was the uncomfortable position to take but he he realized that if he could get through that situation he would be better for it in the long term and I, that's always sort of rung in my head and when mm -hmm. these types of situations arise I say what's the uncomfortable decision to make in this point and and in that and that gathering for example I was sort of forcing my way not forcing my way into conversations but trying to just initiate and I you know I typically don't either you know just go out of my way to say hey what are you talking about or, or I'm just going to butt in on this conversation yeah, right mm -hmm. <laughs> So yes, it's 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 an acquired skill. Um, where do you think it, it, that that trait in you um, came from, or is it something that you remember for, as, as from when you were a little kid? What what trait is that? This aspect of not um, sort of not being the first one to, to to kind of speak out, or being you mentioned earlier that you're like an introvert. Um. It goes back to elementary school, first grade, you know, um, that's when I, I, I remember comparing myself to other people. Um, but it's actually something that I'm, 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 th I'm thinking about interviewing people I went to first grade with, mm. um, and to talk to them about what that experience was for them, but also to sort of um, ask them about how they saw me, how they perceived me. Um, I was thinking about this on the drive home today. Because hmm. I, I, I think I've been wanting to do something along those lines for a long time. And I realized there's something really stopping me from doing that. Because a lot of I, some of these people are, are I'm connected to on Facebook. Hmm. And I think it would kind of be interesting to start interviewing these people and just just, just to, to explore a variety of different things. But for me, you know, as far as getting back to your question, uh, this idea of what started changing for me started changing there. Because then I started, started become, becoming aware of that there was a social hierarchy, mm. that people who were handsome, that were good at sports... Um, that all these things made you, gave you higher positioning, <laughs> even though it's first grade. Yeah. <laughs> right? But man, it was like life or death then, you know? And, uh, and me understanding that I was very low on that ranking, you know, as far as how I was treated by the other kids and, you know, when you're getting picked to play kickball and all this other stuff. Yeah. You know? That's when I started becoming very self-conscious of the fact that, okay, I don't place in this stuff. That the things that I'm good at, at good at, may give me good grades, but it doesn't bring me any value as with respect to my peers. So I think that that sort of, um, that sort of thinking started brewing there and it just progressed and got worse and worse <laughs> as I as I get, get got older. So um I think to some extent it's trying to unlearn a lot of that behavior. And um you know I've gotten I've gotten better uh at it, but it's amazing how those those old feelings just creep up. Hmm. Yeah, and, and it's know. just those learnings at such a such an early age have such a long lasting impressionable effect. Yeah. But you, you know, you learn that, that, you know, those 
despite the fact that I'm feeling that, it doesn't mean that that has anything to do with reality. Yeah. Because when people look at me, they're not seeing what I'm feeling. So I may be feeling insecure or fearful, but most people don't see that. Mm -hmm. So it's like, okay, so maybe not, I, I'm not necessarily that. And then acting accordingly. Right? Yeah. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you think is uh, something that's uh, misunderstood about you? Wow, misunderstood about me. You know, once one time someone said to me when they first met me that he thought I was wasn't arrogant, but he thought that I was Maybe aloof was the word. It wasn't the word. I don't think it was the word, but he, he thought that I came from the sort of upper class sort of thing. So I think aloof was the kind of word that it was. And I think sometimes people may think that I'm aloof, but it's just that I'm, I'm so much in my head that, and I'm not, the most, um, I'm not, even though I do a podcast <laughs> and I talk and talk and talk and interview, I'm not the first one to open my mouth in a group of people. I'm, I'm not, you know, you know, Charlie Gab fast. I'm not, you know, engaging. I, I, I will observe, I will look, I will just, you know, I will assess, you know, my situ you know, the situation and the environment that I'm, that I'm in. And sometimes I can be kind of late to the party as a result because people have sort of made uh, made their judgments on the fact that I'm being quiet and that I'm not jacked in uh, immediately like everyone else is. You know, <laughs> people say, "Oh, he talks," <laughs> <laughs> you know? which is probably one of the reasons I married the woman that I did because she, oh, you know. She, she she's a social animal. She's she, an icebreaker. She, she is, man. She you get in there and then she just uh, takes over and I just like hang on to her coattails and it's like, okay. That's good. You know, my social life is is a direct result of, of her. I don't think I I would have much of one uh if I wasn't married to a woman like that. So you compliment each other well. Oh yeah, thank God. Well, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Um, anybody next? Thank you so much for this. Uh, what's going on, Pat? And then an hour and a half conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. Oh, I, I, I did too. Does this thing go go out uh, the whole hour and a half? Yeah, the whole hour and a half. Oh my god! <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, yeah. It's I, I think it's just I, I like I'm liking more and more the long form, mm -hmm. um, just casual conversation and. I think to what you were speaking to really resonated with me in terms of just, you know, leaving it out as an, as it is, as a, as almost like a captured moment in time, like this conversation is its own thing, you know, all you know, freckles and all. And yeah. I think there's something to be said for like keeping it intact and, uh, and whoever's drawn to it, that's your audience, right? And whoever's <laughs> thinks it's too long and you know, they're, they're not. And so you just slowly over time build, uh, your tribe. Well, you, you, you know, you're a valuable resource for all the people out there who want to get into this thing. Thank you. You know, so I, it gives, I like the fact that this, that podcasting even now is as democratic as it is. Yeah. You know, that anyone can pick up a mic and recorder and make something. Uh, yeah. And I hope that lasts for a very long time. I hope it isn't taken over. Yeah, I think it will because there's always going to be new blood coming in to use your uh, example from earlier with a fresh set of eyes and looking at things that we've probably seen or discussions we've had over the years and looking at the same topics and just applying their own life experiences to the conversation and their own filters and just coming up with an entirely new product or yeah. new, new audio experience. 
So uh, what's the, the best way for folks to track you down? Uh, they can go to thecandidframe.com, and uh, there they'll find uh, the website with the, with the podcast. They'll also see examples of my uh, work there, because the, the site, which is thecandidframe.com, anybody at ebarianx.net, all kind of take you to the same place with different different tabs, landing pages. Um, if they want to f- see what I'm doing on a day-to-day basis, they can follow me on Instagram because uh, I'm usually posting an image uh, every day uh, up there. And I also have a YouTube channel, um, which is also linked to on the on the Candid Frame page where I'm trying to do some new and different stuff there. So, Or you can just Google my name because uh, I'm the only Ivarian exit they're going to find out there. That is true. It is definitely a unique name and it's very easy to... To, to find you online. Well, thanks again for your time. I uh, hope you have a fantastic night and I'm looking forward to engaging again in person as uncomfortable as that might be for either one of us. <laughs> It'll be a little easier next time. Well, thank you though. All right. Have a good night. So I hope you took my advice seriously, listened to it throughout the end and were as impressed with Abadio Next as I was. He's very, he's very soft-spoken but don't don't be fooled by the soft spokenness. He's very smart. He takes his craft seriously, whether it's photography or storytelling or podcasting. And I was thoroughly impressed with the show. And I hope you enjoyed the interview as much as I did. Uh, it's one of those ones that I'm sitting through it, and I'm and I'm thinking, wow, he he's providing such valuable content both to new podcasters and experienced podcast podcasters in terms of the importance of listening carefully when you're interviewing. It's something that just bears repeating. I, I can't hear that advice enough. So we are proud, uh, proud members of the Podcastica network, and we have some good news. Podcastica just added a brand new show to its roster. It's Radio Film Diaries, Radio Film School. Sorry, Ron. <laughs> Radio Film School. Um with the host of Ron Dawson. If that name rings a bell, then Ron was actually a guest on Podcast Junkies several episodes ago. I was so impressed with his adherence and and dedication to quality in his show that I had a a conversation afterwards with my Podcastica family, and we very quickly decided that we wanted to bring Ron on board in his podcast. And you can head on over to podcastica.com and you'll see the show listed there. And we're so happy that he's part of the family. We're so happy the family is growing. If you remember last week, I talked about Morgan Dix and the One Mind podcast. So things are moving here, and that's a good sign for a network. Um, we're sort of the, of the opinion that rising tides lift all boats, and uh, we're, we're always looking for candidates that fit the, the description of being passionate uh, about their content and about their quality and uh, just being overall good people. So um, we're happy to have him on board, and I hope you get a chance to check out his most recent episode where he introduces Podcastica, and he gives folks an overview of what his show is about. So it's a nice primer for uh, Radio Film School. So please check that out. The music was provided by Cedar and Soil. Check out cedarsoil.com. You can subscribe to the podcast at podcastjunkies.com. And uh, don't forget... Your support is immensely appreciated, and uh, I really think it's something that you can do uh, for this podcast or for any podcast that you're getting value of. So please do that if you haven't done so already, and check out the show notes. We, we take a lot of time in putting those together, and we call out uh, some of the things we, we talked about during the show, links that were mentioned, and other things on the site that you can do to support the show. So we have groups that are active in Facebook and on Twitter. And we have a behind-the-scenes group called Podcast Junkies Junkies. So if you haven't checked that already, go in there. I periodically shoot videos and let people know what's going on, uh, what's motivating me, who I'm inspired by, and other things behind the curtain, if you will, related. So check it out there and engage and continue the conversation. If you made it this far, then you know to listen out to the retention hashtag. And I think um, what we're going to do is, actually, if you made it this far, then go ahead and tag both of us. The uh, Twitter will, the Twitter handle will be in the show notes. And the hashtag you can put is uh, Ibadio Next. So I'm going to spell that out for you. It's I-B-A-R, 
I O N E X. Just do hashtag about your next. I can't imagine there would be that many. Um, and podcast underscore junkies is our Twitter handle. And just let us know that you made it this far and that you got value out of it. Anytime you leave a comment, it is very much appreciated. Thanks for enjoying the show. Thanks for enjoying the ambient noise. I'm here in Santa Monica and I uh, hope you have a fantastic day. Take care, guys. Mm-hmm.